Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host of Creativity, Montessori, and the Meaning of Life. I want to open with a, an excerpt from a book called Montessori Learning in the 21st Century, A Guide for Parents and Teachers by M. Shannon Helfitch. The segment is called Climbing to New Heights. Certainly, as adults, we take these skills for granted and somehow believe that a child should be able to do them perfectly after one attempt. Adults also don't appreciate the diligence of a child practicing certain movements until he attains a certain level of satisfaction. Even more so, adults usually don't notice the expression of accomplishment on the face of a child once he's mastered an important physical task. A number of years ago, I was eating breakfast in a small bistro in New York City and had the opportunity to watch a young child about 18 months old climb what I saw as her Mount Everest. Okay, the child's Mount Everest was the bench her mother and older sister were sitting on. While they were engaged in animated conversation, the toddler eyed the bench and obviously felt the challenge. She quickly flung her sippy cup aside, intrigued by the bench. She pulled herself up to the bench and struggled mightily to find a way to get one knee over the edge of the bench. Given her bulky diaper and the height of the bench, this was no mere task. But the toddler persisted until she found a technique that allowed her knee to anchor over the top. This was only the first challenge. Next, she had to figure out how to hoist her body weight and that of the diaper over the edge. Observing the struggle, I was so tempted to just give a hand to help, but that would probably have resulted in tears on the part of the child. I resisted. I could only guess at the amount of strength and coordination it took for the little girl, but again, with significant trial and error. She figured out how to get her knee far enough over the edge to make it work as a lever. Finally, she succeeded. The toddler got up onto the bench turned herself around to sit like her mother and big sister, and beamed with delight at her accomplishment. Mother and sister noticed her presence, took it all for granted, quietly smiled, and kept on conversing. One would think that having succeeded, the little girl would stay put. This assumption only fits when we think of the movement as a goal to accomplish and check off the list of goals for the moment. Not so for the young child. The little girl immediately figured out how to turn back around on the bench, slide her legs over the edge, and let gravity pull her back to the ground. Then she proceeded to scale this mountain again and again. No one noticed, no one stopped her activity, and no one told the child what a good job she was doing. She didn't need recognition. She was carrying out the activity for the sole purpose of meeting the challenge. Each repetition became more efficient as the toddler learned from her successes and failures. Observing all of this reminded me of the great resilience of children and the need for practice, even practice that would seem meaningless to the adults. This is a segment from the book, Your Creative Peace, Find and Deepen Your Creative Voice While Connecting with God, written by myself, Robin Norgren, and you can actually find this book on my website. Movement in Body and in Language. I want to start with a quote by Eddie Cantor. Slow down and enjoy life. It's not only the scenery you miss by moving and going too fast. You also miss the sense of where you are where you are going, and why. Slow down and enjoy life. It's not only the scenery you miss by going too fast. You also miss the sense of where you are going and why. Moving your body. Movement in general. Whatever you bring to this notion of engaging God through your creative engagements... Make sure you bring curiosity. 
for curiosity desires to look at the opportunity to draw deeper and closer to God. Curiosity helps you to inquire more of you when you engage the words in the Bible and you draw in closely. A breeze of, I wonder, might come in handy when trying new things. Some good old-fashioned what if fits the bill as well. All three fall under the same umbrella. I want you to love the Psalms. I want more for you to meet and fall in love with the God of the Psalms. God is textured, meaty, engaging, mysterious, willing to be known. Have you ever chosen a word for your year and then cultivated what it all means? How about choosing the word dance? Yes, I said dance. Hands in the air, music playing loud for three or four minutes. Just one song. How hard could it be? For some reason, for me, it's difficult. Why? I, I tackled all my fears about creativity and loving life more fully and living it to the fullest extent. But for some reason, I was holding this simple thing, movement, as my own private piece of me that I had retired. So, one year, I decided to dance. This prayer is from a book called Solo. It's a Bible study written by Eugene Peterson. Here's a Bible verse from the New Living Translation. Ephesians 3, 20, 21. God can do anything you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it by not pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. Like Paul, ask God for a revelation of the unbelievable, limitless love of Jesus Christ. Ask for strength, for the freedom to live fully, and not just out of a sense of duty. Praise God for his incredible ability to do anything and so much more than we can imagine. And then ask him for all you can hope for, knowing that you can trust in his boundaries his boundless love, and his care for you. Here's an excerpt from the book Crushing, God Turns Pressure into Power by T.D. Jakes. The segment is called Why Not You? I've been escorted to the breaking points of life many times before. And what added to my confusion was the realization that the most grievous points of my journey followed closely behind moments of extraordinary joy. I remember when God began adjusting my perspective of the pain we feel during the pruning seasons of life. My family was experiencing unprecedented blessings. The church was doing extremely well. And great opportunities for ministry continued to present themselves. Then the economic collapse of 2008 shattered my happiness. Within a matter of months, I went from witnessing a harvest season that drove me to my knees in praise to finding myself in a season where every fruitful endeavor and vine was agonizingly chopped down to the roots. While I had already been subsidizing the payroll of our church staff, I no longer had the resources to cover dozens of employees. We had to lay off 40 people. What could have possibly been the purpose of allowing the church to be fat with a surplus and then suddenly to be peeled down to the bones? It wasn't until I was gazing out of those all too familiar windows during one of those lonely dark nights of the soul when I finally allowed myself to ask God, why me, Lord? 
He shocked me with his response in three simple words. Why not you? The master's sharp and direct question highlighted a mistake I didn't even realize I had made. I had incorrectly assumed that I, my family, and others around us had sinned and not repented of it. As if we had been provoked, as if we had to have provoked his judgment in some way. Kindly, the Lord reminded me of when pruning takes place. Pruning always happens after the harvest. There I was, questioning God's timing and wisdom in my life, when his schedule was perfect. God's pruning of the branches of blessings in my life, on the heels of a massive harvest, were in direct keeping with the very words of the Master himself. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit. John 15, 2. Notice that Jesus did not say he prunes some of the branches that bear fruit. Rather, he cuts back every fruit-bearing branch. God's pruning of me was not because I did not I, because I did something wrong. I felt the searing pain of the cutting back of my branches because I did something right. I bore fruit. So before you ask why me, may I dare to ask why not you? God has confirmed you on the back end of a harvest season as you stand in the middle of your vines that now have no fruit. There are others who, like you, can point to their history and cry aloud to the Father, I've done everything right. But your behavior does not make you immune to the same wounds every other productive branch receives. Look around you to the other vines in the field and see that they too have suffered the cutting at the hands of the Master. You are part of a select group of people who's been chosen by the vine dresser to be pruned because you have done something that other branches have not fulfilled your purpose. Thanks so much for stopping by. You can find all that I'm into over on Instagram, where my links are all kept, either under at Robin underscore Norgren, N-O-R-G-R-E-N, or at U-B-U for life, all words spelled out.